Welcome everyone. I'm April Swanson, the program manager at Artadia. On behalf of Artadia and SAIC's Department of Exhibitions and Exhibition Studies, thank you all for joining us tonight. Artadia is a national nonprofit's art organization supporting visual artists with unrestricted grants and connections to opportunities for creative and professional growth. Over the past 21 years, we have provided almost 350 Artadia awardees to artists in six cities across the United States. Our mission is to provide visual artists with the support they need to sustain a thriving practice and continue to contribute to their city's arts communities. Art and Dialogue invites curators from across the United States who are experts in their field to deeply engage with each award city through a series of virtual studio visits and local, with local awardees and public programs like this one, co-hosted with local partner organizations. For today's Art and Dialogue program, we are thrilled to have Adrian Edwards, Angle Speyer Family Curator and Curator of Performance at the Whitney Museum in New York City, in conversation with Huey Copeland, the Interim Director of Black Arts Initiative at Arthur Anderson Teaching and Research Professor and Associate Professor of Art History at Northwestern University. Following the conversation, we will have 15 minutes for questions and answers afterwards. So Adrian and Huey, uh, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Thanks, April. Hi, Thank you. Huey. Hi. <laughs> well, I want to say thanks um, to April, to Artadia, to SAIC for um, this wonderful opportunity, and of course, foremost to Adrian for this opportunity to continue our very long-standing dialogue. It's always a pleasure to share space and ideas with you, Adrian, even in this strange virtual world we find ourselves in. It's true, it's very strange, super bizarre. Um, yeah, I'm most grateful to Artadia, um, April, and Misery who coordinated two incredible days of studio visits with Chicago-based artists that's been really illuminating, very rich, very satisfying, really great conversations. Um, and also to SAIC and Trevor and everyone who um, invited me. Thank you, this is, this is great. Uh, I have to say doing studio visits has been a bit of a lifeline in the middle of all of this, you know, it's like, I don't know if I told you this, Huey, I probably did, but like March 12th, uh, David Breslin, who I'm organizing the next biennial with, were at, an, at New Orleans airport um, mm. the night of March 12th, and we'd gone through like Texas and driving, and then we'd flown to New Orleans, and I remember when we got off the plane in New Orleans, we were like, oh, wait a minute, there's no one in this airport. <laughs> we were like, why are we in the airport? <laughs> <laughs> and that was probably the last time you were in an airport for a minute, right? Exactly, exactly. And the museum closed the next day. And here we are over six months later. Yeah. 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 So maybe just to start off, I mean, how are you doing? I mean, both in the colloquial sense of how are you feeling, but also more literally, how are you doing? Which is to say, how are you kind of moving forward in your thought and your research in this moment where it seems just as easy to be galvanized as it is to be paralyzed by outrage and fear and despair in the pandemic itself? Yeah, it's an interesting question and multivalent in a way. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that sort of immediately um, it, there was a moment of paralysis. I mean, I think mm -hmm. in a funny way, David and I had to kind of figure out how we could continue to do our work related to the biennial while, um, while sort of not being with one another, able to be in artist studios. And I was super skeptical at first, right? Like, how are we gonna do this? And then you're just like in the middle of this thing. Um, but that became definitely, you know, a lifeline um, to kind of keeping that going and less related to the making of a show, you know, that's obviously a part of it, but more of just the dialogue, you mm. know? Like we would spend conversations just being like, how are you? What are you doing? Can you make? Can you not? Mm -hmm. And because I was, I'm here in New York, 
and uh, I live in Brooklyn. And it was eerie. Those first, I would say, six weeks were intense because of where I live in Brooklyn. Mm. The sirens were constant, um, you know, like right on the edge of where bed and Crown Heights meet. And it was just an intensity day and night of, um, of sirens. So that had this real kind of sonic element to it. Um, and then I would take, I, I started taking these five mile walks a day. Mm. day I take these five mile, mile walks. And that was clear, has been um, a process of trying to get clarity around this moment. And in some ways, COVID, this pandemic has been the great clarifier, right? It's been like, there are sort of a whole set of presuppositions that maybe imbue the work that I do both curatorially and academically and in the writing realm. Um, but those were initially, uh, I felt could were possibly compromised. What do I mean by that? I mean that like I had a real moment within the first two weeks of this where I was like, oh my gosh, I'm writing about blackness. So much of what I do is about blackness. And here we have this thing, right? That is the great equalizer. Mm. And, like in those first two weeks. At least it would seem in, like that in the first few weeks. Yeah. Exactly. I was just like, oh my gosh, like, am I gonna, you know, am I now, you know, what do we do with this in the context of something? that is compromising humanity. Mm. Of course, very quickly, I was like, oh, right, this never fails. <laughs> you know, and it's sad, but I, you know, we laugh in, in the face of, of sadness because otherwise it's just the absurdity of it is un, unreal. So I, um, I had that almost existential moment around, you know, how I was investing in time. And the other thing that was really, is was the clarifier is like what are our institutions doing at this mm -hmm. moment you know, there was a moment of like wow am i going to have a job or not mm -hmm. are the projects that i've spent years working on going to continue or not and i'm happy to say that they are but we just did not know um and then you know mm -hmm. it, it was for the first time ever um i had writer's block i was not able to write for the first three months or so. Wow. I, the thing that, and, and Huey, you know me. I mean, I was sitting there looking at like my emails today going like, when did Huey and I start dialoguing with one another? And I put your name into my Gmail account and it like was like one through 50 and then many, many more. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, you've just been there the whole time. You know, you're one of this, like, very small group of people who have been there from day one in this journey. So it was like, I, I couldn't write, but then it shifted. So between the talking to artists mm. and then the writing, I've done so much writing once I got through those first two months. And what broke it for me was the uprising. Mm. Mm -hmm. like, sitting there thinking, well, we're still clearly in the midst of a pandemic, right? Yeah. But I'm, I remember it was a Friday night and I remember seeing um, the protesters outside of the CNN building in Atlanta start throwing things into the glass, right? And I said, and, and Atlanta is where I'm from. Like that's yeah. where I was born, I grew up in South Carolina. So I was like, oh, this is real. Like mm -hmm. that was a very real moment for me um, because of its personal resonance. Yes. And I knew the Omni and I knew like, I knew where they were. And so the next day I got up by myself and went to join the protest. And it was only in that putting my body in that context did the writing come back. Wow. That's really, that's really fascinating um, because it not only kind of, you know, underlines 
you know, the kind of importance of sustained dialogue and engagement, particularly in these moments when it seems sort of less accessible, but then actually physically shifting your location, whether that's be going on the walk or actually being part of those protests, right? Somehow free something up um, mentally, right? That sort of underlines how fundamentally connected those things are. Um, and of course, you know, we're in a moment where we see a tremendous amount of protest work, performative work being done in the streets, online, and in the cultural sphere more broadly that's aimed precisely at addressing these long-standing structures of racial and sexual inequity that the pandemic um, has brought out. And I just was wondering, I mean, how you think about the effectivity and resonance of these different kinds and modes of, you know, performance. I mean, I'm thinking of, say, the Black Square used for Blackout Tuesday, right? Ostensibly this gesture to show solidarity with Black Lives Matter. And so, you know, all of these gestures, you know, have their powerful effects, but also kind of have their liabilities, um, both as political and aesthetic gestures. So I just wonder how you think about um, charting and negotiating those practices, especially when you're putting your body on the line um, uh, to, to make yourself heard. Yeah, I love this question. And you know, it's funny, Huey, that you ask it around the black square, right? And its relationship to that kind of like blackout uh, hashtag thing or act or whatever you want to call it. I mean, it was, it's interesting because it was in 2015. I remember mm -hmm. I was working on the Performa Biennial and I remember it was late at night and I was sitting like kind of in our office at the headquarters, like our hub. And I had an email from you and it was the subject line was basically like, girl, this is a gift. <laughs> right, because I had been doing all this work around black monochromes and Malevich, and you were, and this was an article that was basically explaining that conservators in um, Saint Petersburg, Russia, had discovered that the zero degree of painting actually had, you know, Malevich's uh, black square uh, of 1915 had sort of three inscriptions, a uh, proto-supremacist painting and a sort of hybrid cubist futurist painting. And this inscription that basically translates to Negroes battling in a cave. And I remember reading that because in trying to do the work around the monochrome, what'd you say? Negroes battling in a cave at night. At night, excuse right. me, forgot that last part. Yes, at night. Um, and it just was incredible because I was looking at a range of artists from Adam Pendleton and Glenn Ligon and um, certainly Rodney McMillan and Ellen Gallagher and Rasheed Johnson. And I mean, there were just so many. Um, and trying to make this relationship between certain kind of interest around um, conceptual art in particular, where the concept becomes this fundamental um, relationship to race. So race becomes the concept in conceptualism for these artists and that um, rather than this kind of dematerialization um, of, of the work or the art object, that the dematerialization actually resides elsewhere. And that is in these concepts of identity through which the black monochrome, I would argue, becomes the sort of a manifestation of that. Yes. And so this move of like opacity, withdrawal, illegibility, fugitivity, um, it, visually within the context of visual representation was so interesting. So that the move to then sort of mark solidarity through the black square um, was somehow absolutely right and absolutely wrong, right? Like absolutely right because it had this whole historical art historical precedence that was rooted in race, that was rooted in racist ideology um, that was about, um, I think in the European context, uh, sublimating the body that yeah. had kind of been recuperated in a way or were subverted and shifted 
-hmm. unbeknownst, I think, to the artists who were doing it. It was just almost like instinctive in the way that affect can hit you. Like most people misunderstand affect, right? They think of affect as feeling, when in fact it is not about feeling. It's that thing that rises up before you can actually say it's this. Yes. Once you can say it's this, you're not in the realm of affect. You're, you're dealing with something else. So I was thinking about that. And I was thinking about um, this relationship to a certain kind of accumulation, right? Like, Ale takes his, he's actually riffing off of the work of Paul Villiot, another artist who had actually made the, a painting that was that had this inscription. So it's like artist talking to artist talking to artist. <laughs> right, so Alphonse Allais does the kind of cartoon with the black square in what, 1898, right? 97, and, I think, yeah. Close enough. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he's already responding. And so, I mean, I think it just underlines that blackness becomes this ground or logic or mode of signification for artists. And it's something that we know, right? If we understand the history of modernism that's been practiced in the West, the way in which figures of blackness, whether we're talking about, um, you know, Lore, the maid in Menes Olympia, or, you know, Cindy Sherman's early bus riders, where she's doing this kind of full on bodily blackface performance, that those iterations of blackness are so key to all kinds of avant-garde practice, but then to discover how foundational it was also to this discourse around abstraction, right? Which is often the way, which is often seen to be a kind of site freed from or to allow space outside of the logics of racial capture that to see that they're themselves part and parcel of that logic in a foundational way is astonishing. And I think, you know, one of the things that you know, we can't quite account for both with the Black Square um, in Malievich's hands or on Blackout, uh, Blackout Tuesday is its radical kind of multivalence, right? Um, that it can be both absolutely right and absolutely wrong. And that's simply part of how we have to understand the shiftiness of Blackness as a kind of signifier that gets mobilized for these range, range of ends. Right, and you can't get it in the black square circulating in social media, you can't get the thickness of it. Mm -hmm. It's the quality that makes it so distinct when black artists take it, right? Like there is not just this conceptual density, but this material density that actually yes. does all of the kind of signifying, right? Like I'm very deeply interested in how the work of art is already telling you what it is. Mm -hmm. already like really foregrounding what the concerns are. Um, and so in a way, that black square also got me back to um, Evil Selma 27, which is a piece by Tony Cox. I think I got the title right, it's Evil Selma, I forget the number exactly. But, and I wrote about this for your brilliant dossier that was in the ASAP journal, and I think it's online now, yeah. but, 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 Tony in this video through our literal speed is talking about the distinction in the civil rights movement, right, of the 50s and 60s, what, what was possible before television. Mm -hmm. right? Like when you had to actually, you could hear reports through the radio, but the work of having to imagine the revolution, of having to imagine what was actually happening, as opposed to um, what happens when people see the image and can say, oh, now I know what that is. Yes. So what is the gap between the like, and this was very applicable, I think, to what was happening around and has continued to happen around um, the latest uprisings of the summer around George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and so on and so forth. You know, the, the list is exhaustive, is an inexhaustible, but it's, it's, I'm, I'm very much interested in what can be held out through withholding. Like, mm -hmm. I think I want to demand a certain kind of intimacy to access, you have to have a certain kind of intimacy to access the range 
of implications around blackness. It yeah. should not be made so, the, the real issues and complexities when it's made so readily and easily available to you. No, I think that's so rich and exactly right. And I think, um, you know, two things I sort of want to hold on to, which are so resonant and particularly th th thinking about your show and writing and blackness as abstraction is one, this kind of emphasis on facture, right? On surface and how um, in making us attend to that, we have to think about, well, blackness isn't just something that one, sees all at once and it has these different kind of textures and variations that in many ways engaging it is a process of feeling it out right um, in senses that are haptic and bodily um, and I think the other thing too is the way in which the blackness can open up onto these kind of spaces for imagination and the imaginary and I I remember seeing a brilliant talk by my uh, good friend and colleague, Hannah Feldman, that was about the processes of decolonization in Algeria. And she said, you know, what does decolonization look like? It looks like this. And she just showed a black screen, right? Because it's a process that we can't yet imagine, right? And that needed to somehow be this sort of stand in for it, right? In terms of a kind of visual presentation. Um, but I think one of the things that's so striking, even about this conversation and all our conversations, um, is just how fluidly and deftly you move between fields and media and discourses. You know, I can talk to you about art history, I can talk to you about black studies, I can talk to you about performance, I can talk to you about exhibitions, I can talk to you about like really bad TV. Um, and you're able to move among these different areas and stage really brilliant conversations among them that sort of put pressure, right, on a lot of the operative assumptions that we have when we think we're doing art history or we're doing performance studies or we're doing black studies. So I wonder if you could just talk about that approach, both as a kind of scholarly method that's sort of animating your writing and as a kind of curatorial strategy, because you've been so successful, I think, in staging um, work that, you know, I think of your incredible Jason Moran exhibition that was not necessarily, one wouldn't think Jason Moran in the space of the gallery at the Walker, but when you curate that show and we see this, how these objects work together, of course it makes sense, but I think it really takes your kind of imagination and your ability to sort of work between these different areas to do that. So I would just love for you to talk about, you know, how you balance those um, concerns and discourses. Yeah, I mean, I, um, it's funny, I had the pleasure of being in dialogue a lot over the last year with David Hammonds. And one of the things in one of our conversations he said to me was that you realize that everything you do is autobiographical. Mm. And I was like, what? He goes, oh yeah, like you, you know, when you write something, he says it actually tells someone more about you than it does about what you're writing, which I never thought that, right? But I think it's a really interesting position to put yourself in to kind of think about why you do what you do and how you do it. And I say that in this context because I just, my mind just works that way, but I was also deeply educated that way. I mean, when I decided to go back to graduate school um, after having studied uh, Italian Renaissance art for a master's and decided that was not where I wanted to <laughs> invest my time any longer, but it taught me a lot about perspective, right? Mm -hmm. And about iconography. Like literally that work is to teach you how to read what you're looking at as you know, Huey. And I was like, well, I'm not, I don't, this legibility is actually deeply problematic to me. <laughs> so I wanted to shift to think about, well, what is, how does it, how does something make me feel? What is that thing doing in the world? Like whether it's a performance or an exhibition or whatever it is, like what can it do? And in trying to focus on the doing, I think has given things a very different glance. And I don't, um, I also wanted to do a project, this is why I ended up in performance studies. I mean, Jose Munoz was essential to getting me going. And 
in some ways, one of the first things I read by him was, you know, feeling brown. Mm -hmm. so, and, and I remember that it was like a book of Adorno that he gave me after I met with him and this article on feeling brown, because he knew exactly what I was trying to get at when I didn't have the language to get there yet. But, but we got there. Um, so it's like, I think in putting these things into a consolatory relationship that you can actually gain more than looking at them on their own. So I'm interested in performance's relationship to object making. I'm interested in how we think about the afterlife of what a performance is. Um, and I think that most art could benefit from an interdisciplinary rigorous um, analysis in terms of thinking about the writing. Um, and that it's not so much, it can be about relations between artists, relationships between time periods and, and geographical areas, but it gets way more interesting when you kind of tear down those boundaries, right? You can mm -hmm. note them, but don't be limited by them in order to kind of do maybe some messy work that, that could get you somewhere else that might illuminate that thing in a very different way. And it's just really worked well for me, like in an exhibition context, like Jason's show, which you mentioned. The thing about Jason's show, and I was very happy the reviewer got this for the New from the New York Times, is that there's museum time, right? Like you show up, uh, well, it's open from whatever to whatever, 10 to five, 10 to six, whatever, depending on the institution. Um, and you have the freedom to move through that show at your own pace. You can choose to read the labels or not. You can choose to sit in the video room and, and watch a video or not. But with Jason's show, you wanted to put people in a museum context, but on the time of performance, mm. which meant you had to sit with it. You had to engage in duration in a different way. So that's a kind of became a curatorial technique to, um, to shift and determine the show based on the nature of the work itself, right? And on the, and on the institute, and then the context in which it's being shown. Yeah, now that is so fantastic. And I think it just, you know, underlines um, the ways in which art history stands to benefit from evolved from the lessons of cultural studies and performance studies and black studies, where it is about this notion of a doing, right? That even a stilled object is something that's a doing. It's a performing, it's unfolding, right? Materially in time, in relationship to us, becoming entangled um, with us, having all kinds of effects, even as we're affecting it. Um, and I think it just opens up so much in terms of what we think about objects, there's histories, how we understand the relationships between them. And precisely, you know, you use this wonderful word constellation, right? The kind of constellations that we can put them in. And one of the things I thought was so wonderful about uh, the Moran show, which I saw um, at the Walker, um, my colleague and I, Sam Aranke, said, we need to go and see this exhibition. I was so glad y'all came. <laughs> he did. And then Sam, another kind of brilliant person, right, working on our objects coming out of a kind of performance uh, training um, and also SEIC. Um, mm -hmm. And I think both of us were kind of blown away that you, I think, not only was it sort of a beautiful show, but you were able to constellate the objects, the sort of videos, the sort of performative stages in relationships to each other that it didn't feel like we were having to say, oh, we're gonna have a white cube with some black box part or a black box with some white cube parts. Instead, it was a larger kind of atmosphere that you could move forward and not ever lose sight of the work that you're focused on, but always sort of have an awareness of sort of sitting in a constellation, um, which I think is just kind of such a wonderful and smart curatorial strategy. Mm -hmm. um, and so how do you, I mean, another one of the things I think you, you said is, is this notion that, you know, from Hammond's that everything you're doing in a way is autobiographical, which is particularly interesting for me because I'm at a point of my own writing where increasingly I sort of appear as a character in my kind of critical voicing and critical writing, not so much to sort of perform a confessional 
control, but to locate myself um, so that the reader knows where I'm coming from and where that and how that position is going to prime affect my reading and also clues them into my blind spots and the fact that, you know, so often in kind of contemporary artistic practice, we're not just curators or art historians, but we're interlocutors and friends and models and occupying all of these diverse kinds of positions and roles. So I just wonder how you sort of think about, you know, negotiating and wearing all those sort of different hats um, yourself and also whether you're feeling now that you're bringing more of yourself into the work um, and feel sort of licensed to do so. Yeah, it, it's, um, it's an interesting question. I would say that in the context of academia, they demanded that I account for the fact that I was also a curator. In other words, it was as though I had a different level of access and knowing, particularly the, the fact that many of the artists, not all, but many of the artists that I write about, I also work with curatorially, right? So it's as though there was some kind of like, as though I had some, some kind of access to a secret lab mm. <laughs> where ideas were getting tested out with artists that I would then write about in academic context. And because performance studies has come out of a sort of anthropological, amongst its many disciplines, anthropology is certainly, ethnography is certainly mm -hmm. one of the more important fields that have influenced performance studies, particularly you know, at NYU, um, is one has to take account for where you're sitting in relationship to this. And while I've never, sort of literally combine the two, they are always circling one another. Mm. So academic scholarly work, writing is always circling the curatorial work. They're always, I try to keep them actually separate. I think for more selfish reasons than not. It's mm. like, it's all my work, um, but in a way the academic world, as you know, Huey for me is a space where I, I get to have total freedom and control, mm. absolute over what I want to say and write. I mean, it's just like this incredible space where I get to do some gymnastics and thought. Um, and that I, that I don't necessarily have, I mean, I have to account for a lot of different things in the context of curatorial work. You account for audiences you know, curating is essentially, oh, means care, <laughs> like to care for something. So I see myself as caring for these artists. So in, very, in many ways, it's like building a trust and a rapport and a discourse with them for many of them over years. Um, and I'm very sensitive to the people that I establish those relationships with um, because you're in it for the long term. And yeah. many people don't think about this with, and a lot is on the line, quite frankly. You know, no one really thinks about the stakes um, of what it means to um, navigate your own inst your own beliefs and in politics, the institutions' beliefs and in politics, and how do you manage that in the care of an artist? So it's um, it has a different set of demands that uh, one has to be responsive to even having the total freedom to select the artist you want to work with, you're also then investing with them in something over years. I mean, yeah. I have two shows coming up that I've been working with them for two years on these particular projects. We still have another year to go. So it's a long haul. And in institutional time, you don't do projects at least not in the scale of the institution that I'm at, at the Whitney, you know, it takes years before you get another big show. So you better be fully committed to someone mm -hmm. <laughs> to do that. So relationships are really important um, and rapport is really important and being able to share um, in a dialogue and language is very important. And it's all incredibly 
you know, rewarding. Yeah, no, that's that's absolutely fantastic. And it reminds me of something. I was in a conversation with um, Jarrett Ernest and, you know, we're talking about what it means to be working on and writing about living artists and how so much of that, you know, can seem as if it's you're writing out of the space of the relationship. And I think, you know, well, for me, I was like, well, it's not as if I'm writing out of the space of the relationship, but the relationship is super vital and important. And I precisely want to care for it um, because I care for the artist and I have a respect for them and the work that they're doing. But the on the other side of that, I also have a care and investment in you know, getting something right about the work, right, for mm -hmm. different kinds of audiences. And so I totally see that kind of desire to manage these kinds of, you know, ethical responsibilities to all the communities that you're engaged with and that you're speaking to. And I think it's especially important um, when you're writing about thinking with engaging Black artists who are so often, you know, institutionally maligned or instrumentalized or kind of disrespected and having that real ground of engagement is you know, precisely key, right? To being able yeah. to move the work forward. Absolutely. And, you know, it's the stakes and the generosity of the gig. Mm -hmm. It's all of that. Yeah. And you just need you know, there are so many more people than when I started, you know, Black curators, there's so many more. Um, but, you know, there are never too many. So it's kind of like, and it's not that we exclusively can do this work, mm -hmm. but we would be kidding ourselves if we didn't say that there's a special sensitivity to the way that we do things. Yeah. So, I mean, with you having said that, I mean, I wonder as we sort of go look to a close. Uh, a couple well, things. Last. I know, right? <laughs> I was like, oh, good. Um, I guess the first one would be, you know, sort of maybe following up on that. You know, how, for, for your perspective as scholars and thinkers and curators, how do we continue pushing? and reimagining the boundaries of the aesthetic in light of, you know, not only what has been brought to light in this particular moment, but also in light of our own kind of um, ethical amb ambitions and political commitments. And how does that relate to where you see yourself going and where your work is sort of taking you next? Hmm. Well, it's funny, those things have always been there. I remember when I used to like give talks, you know, maybe a decade ago, and I would talk about like, for me, being a curator is an ethical, it has an ethical imperative to it. And, you know, people would look at you strangely, like, what do you mean? Like, just make the shows and build your <laughs> career. <laughs> Don't bring ethics into this, you know? Like, ooh. Um, and I remember when, the Whitney came to me about this position and I was very clear about sending them stacks of what I'd written because I was like, I want them to know where I stand on things. <laughs> and to their credit, you know, um, I'm, I'm there. But it's um, the ethical imperative of the work has always been there, will always be there as long as I'm alive to be doing it. Um, it's in terms of the future direction you know, you, you have a show that is, that, that you know, I, I always laugh. I mean, when they came to me about doing the biennial, I um, was not so interested in doing it, um, mm. just to be honest. But then, because, you, sorry? Because? Well, because you, this sort of like what I said earlier, it's like, um, you, get an opportunity to work at a museum and you go in with like a list of artists and show ideas that you want to do like just reams you know and it's like oh I, I I would I have these four or five things and then you look at the exhibition calendar and you realize oh my gosh like if I can do four of these in 15 years mm. I'll be 
you know, like that's, that's a check. So it's kind of like, it was an, in, it's an institutional show in a way. It's incredibly important, but it was David Breslin. David came and said, I want to do this, but I only really want to do it with you. And I was like, okay, it's all your fault then, you know? So, <laughs> out of just a kind of deep mutual respect for one another, you know, David and I speak the same language. We have, we share a lot of sensibilities in art and he's a, a wonderful art historian. And so it would, would be great. I could see how this could be a fun thing to do. And, and challenging and interesting. But also there's that, but there's also the fact of like working now two years, a little over two years at the Whitney. I see what that show, the biennial, which this will be the 80th iteration, wow. um, how it changes the institution. Mm. It's like, it's not obvious to anyone, you know, it's like the show comes and then people are like, they have their feelings about it, it causes uh, whatever controversy it's going to cause it like it has this life blood to it that is mm. also hard and challenging and very necessary and beautiful mm. uh, all at once and you just have to kind of gird your loins and, and jump into it fearlessly and so I see though how it changes the place yes. how it changes shows that we are able to do how it changes the artists that we acquire um, it's extraordinary how it takes the entire building to do that show so that was a, a massive opportunity um and then there are the two shows that are coming up and then the, this wonderful piece of writing huey that i've been doing for you and stephen nelson for cospa as part of the black modernisms anthology book that you all are doing with some incredible scholars um, Kobita Mercer, Kelly Jones, I mean, just like fierce, fierce, fierce. And I wrote this piece on um, Stanley Brown that we are in the process of editing um, because of my obsession with Stanley Brown. I feel like he is singularly emblematic of all of the things that I'm trying to get at around the complexity mm. of um, and in fact, I want to root this sort of sensibility or aesthetic agency around opacity and illegibility and um, obscurity and withdrawal. I really want to root through Stanley Brown yeah, <laughs> more so. Sorry. Could you just say a little bit about his um, practice for, oh. for making go now, since he's such a wonderful figure? Yeah, Stanley Brown was born in Suriname and immigrated to the Netherlands in 1957, um, where he lived until he died very recently. Um, he is certainly a conceptual artist, um, refused to be photographed, refused to have any biographical information about himself circulated, refused to have the work photographed or reproduced in any sort of way. and. I just kept going, what is all of this, the, these sort of constraints around the work that he himself put in, how there was this kind of resistance that was inherent to it and yet not in the work itself. Um, and so this way Brown, which is this um, body of work that he made, whereby he would go into different public squares and areas and Amsterdam and go up to people and ask for um, directions to some place. And they would obviously have a conversation, he would with his interlocutor, but they would also then draw the directions. And the work of art became these drawings on, you know, typically um, normal pieces of paper, white paper, and he would stamp it. Um, this way brown, but he would also often inscribe it this way brown in his handwriting. And so you had this kind of doubling, but he always put himself there in relationship. There was always the I. So I was always curious about the I that he also refused to allow anyone a direct access to, right? So this posed a lot of interesting questions for me. So performance as drawing, the drawing, you know, as a performance, 
um, a performance that was for one who didn't know that they were even involved in a performance or a certain kind of duet happening between him and the other person. Um, I was also really intrigued by his biography, which he didn't want anyone to have access to. So I started looking deeply at the history um, of Suriname and looking at its relationship to the Netherlands, um, looking at the period of colonialization and enslavement. And Suriname was known at the time um, in the Americas to have the most brutal, if one can even kind of calibrate them or qualify, brutal form of enslavement. It was known for being uh, particularly um, debased, awful. Anyway, um, so William Blake had a series of etchings based on um, the travel logs of uh, a Dutch military man, uh, John Stedman. And I do this reading of Stedman's own diaristic accounts of being in Suriname. He was part of the military there to occupy because they also had a lot of slave rebellions. Um, and then Blake then tried to represent all of the violence and brutality against black bodies that Stedman had witnessed. And then I kind of compare that to um, uh, this film that was done in the 70s that was all about imagining post-colonial period um, of, of, of um, of Suriname and sort of uh, van people, it means one people, essentially. Really fantastic film. And kind of thinking about Brown arriving in 57 at a moment when there are only 5,000 Surinamese living in the Netherlands. So might this engagement in these public squares be about something else, about a kind of relationality, about a immigrant trying to kind of find their way, or migrant, because Suriname was a colony, obviously, trying to find their way in the context of this urban area and the complexities around race um, in the Netherlands at that time. So I did a, a lot of historical research looking at it and economic analysis. And yeah, it was a lot of fun to kind of um, play with Stanley's work in the, in the most rigorous of ways. Yeah, well, I mean, it's an absolutely fantastic um, piece. And like all of your work, it's incredibly rich and nuanced, it draws in all these fields. And I think in the context of, you know, this volume, Black Modernisms, um, with so many standouts, it's a standout um, because you're thinking how a performance, a set of performances, performative practices um, from the second half of the 20th century can help us really rethink everything we understand about conceptualism and about histories of modernism, which I think is not only kind of part of the ambition of this project, which is, I think, a thread that kind of animates your work, right? These possibilities for rethinking, reframing um, both uh, those things that we know and that are canonical, um, but also to discover new frameworks and artworks and templates that force more than just a kind of reshuffling of a canonical deck. Um, so I think, you know, that's what always makes your work so insightful and interesting. Um, and I know that we'll all be following <laughs> in the years to come. So I think um, with that, um, perhaps we should open things up to questions via um, our Q&A feature. Yeah, so thank you both so much. Um, that was really incredible. Uh, that was really amazing. So um, we'd love to take this time to open it up, as Huey said, to um, any questions. So you have, if you have any questions for Adrian or Huey, you can type it in the Q&A function uh, now. And that's uh, the button at the bottom of your screen. Okay. So this is from Hugo Ivan Juarez. Uh, I am a first year grad and currently learning about institutional critique. 
and curious to hear your thoughts on what it is like being in the inside of major institutions during the age of institutional critique. Adrian, do you wanna speak to that? Yeah, I would just say um, it's an interesting time without a doubt. And you know, my thing is always to follow the artist. So to the extent that they are engaged and interested in institutional cri critique, I'm all for it. Um, it, we all benefit and learn from, from kind of delving in and taking on that kind of work. Uh, so for example, Dave McKenzie is one of those projects that I didn't really go into, but um, that I will be working on. And Dave will be addressing the sort of fact that the Whitney has, the Renzo Piano building, our, our new building is kind of the counterpoint to Breuer, right? Like, it's, um, which was the old Whitney building uh, on the Upper East Side, in that it's all glass and transparent, but we know that rarely are institutional institutions transparent, right? Uh, mm -hmm. This is also yet a kind of different trope of modernism. And so um, Dave is gonna come in and do a project that involves obscuring the windows and it will happen over as a kind of durational performance mm -hmm. um, and it will, be on Fridays and Saturdays all day long. And I'm like beyond excited to see what he does. And it's just him. So mm -hmm. it's quite a intense durational um, piece. Oh, that sounds like it's gonna be amazing. Um, I, guess, I guess for me, I mean, I think that, um, you know, when I think about sort of institutional critique, one of my touchstones is always the work of Andrea Frazier, right? Who reminds us that, um, you know, institutions aren't just faceless things, they're made out of people and we are in those institutions. So I think this is a moment where us as people, both individual actors and folks who are, you know, in but not of institutions um, can really start to think about and um, have the opportunity to start shifting directions and having those conversations. I think the moment really kind of demands nothing less. And it's exciting to see the you know, willingness to have those uh, conversations. Um, Hugh, it's yeah, a I just wanted to add, Huey, that, I mean, just by nature of the work that I do, you know, working in performance or interdisciplinary projects, that already has a critique function when you're talking about an art museum. Right, mm -hmm. like it is still a real stretch. It takes a real different mental orientation for us to do the projects that I do there, that I instigate there. Um, it does not come easy. It's like, oh right, they're here always, all the time. <laughs> so that in and of itself, just being in that building and having that role in and of itself feels like a certain kind of criticality. Yes, exactly. Um, so unless you wanted to say more, Adrian, I thought I thought we could maybe go to the next question, which is sure. something you know, I to know a little bit about the selection of images that um, you beautifully put together for us. Oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't say anything at all. So the first, you saw the Malevich was the first slide. And then I think there were slides that were from the exhibition that I did at Pace Gallery in 2016. Um, called Blackness and Abstraction. And it was a show that was, you know, really coming out of the last chapter of my dissertation, where a little bit when I was talking about Malevich, it was kind of related to, and you and I were talking about like the black square was kind of related to that work. Um, and that was a, a really wonderful show to, to kind of do. And had a whole host of operations of trying to kind of just see what the color black does amongst works of art. It's like, how does your interpretation um, shift when you see these things in relationship to one another? So we had some real stars in this show. Um, we had Adam Pendleton, Glenn Ligon, and Wendy Shimutu, who did her first abstract work. Um, Ellen Gallagher, who made this incredible um, series of paintings just for the show that was actually titled Negroes Battling in a Cave. 
um, and uh, so on and so forth. Now, this um, begins a set of slides um, for projects I did at Performa. So this was a coming out of that experience with Wangeshi in Blackness and Abstraction, she really wanted to kind of expand that work and her return to live performance, and we did that. This is Ito Barada, um, who did a fabulous film about her mother being part of a prototype to the Peace Corps called Crossroads um, Africa. And Ito did all of the live Foley sound, but did a film where all the people, the characters, her mother's experience being here in the United States um, as um, Montessori school toys, mm. which was a great use of abstraction in the most intelligent way. Um, and she made the curtain that you saw initially there where she made that entirely by hand, the stage curtain. So people came thinking they were seeing a live performance in a way they were with her sound accompaniment. But the real soul of the show was this film that was in, Incredible, um, really, really wonderful. Uh, and then I think the next slide, this was Tracy Rose, um, her first project that she'd done in the United States and New York since the project gallery had closed and it was wild. I just will never forget that. This was Teju Coles. He had begun to take photographs and keep the, um, the and was writing um, ever since the election of Donald Trump. So really kind of documenting on an everyday basis from throughout the world, kind of these responses that were like quotidian and disturbing in their sort of bleakness. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And so he, that was out of a, a project that I did with Teju. This is Josh Begley, worked with him on the film. Um, this was a performance I did with Jason and um, Julie Moretu, um, and they had collaborated over the course of Julie making these two enormous paintings that went to um, SF MoMA and are in their lobby. And Julie made her first, we couldn't, obviously the paintings were going to SF MoMA, so Julie decided to make her first video. And so there was a really detailed panning in moving around, beautiful um, exploration of the paintings that you otherwise would not be able to do uh, while Jason played with his band. And this was Julie's studio. We did it in the studio. Um, Adam Pendleton, who is someone I've been collaborating with for years um, and am personally um, very close to, when I did Freeze New York um, projects in 2018, uh, I asked him once I found out that on Roosevelt Island where Freed's held the fair, there had been a point called Negro's Point. I just came across this in doing research about the island. And I said, oh, Adam, we have to do something. Would you reprise the Black Lives Matter flag that he had done for the Venice Biennale Belgian Pavilion in 2015? And so he made this flag much, much larger. We somehow convinced the Parks Commission to do a poll um, and went to bat quite a bit to try to get it to stay there. And it stayed, um, it was really Freeze's first attempt to do something more uh, of public sculpture. And now they have a program that they do now regularly. Um, but we had to like defend this because the police were upset. It was a bit dramatic. I have to say, but it was beautiful and you could see it from the highway, which was really great. And these are images from Jason's installation at the Whitney, um, not at the Walker where you saw it. And, you know, you have here this attempt to create like, a, not a black box where Jason would typically play like in a jazz club or at like a black box of a theater or a music venue um, and not the white cube. So we really worked with this deep gray and um, carpeted the room and, and did um, the walls. Yeah, so it was was wonderful. And this is a, right as you came off the elevators, an installation of his drawings, but also his scores it was a kind of riff on works on paper. And then Jason and Kara, we somehow miraculously, thank you, thank you, Kara, got uh, her calliope, which was shown um, at Prospect, um, and we were able to um, bring it out of storage 
and um, have it on Gonzavort Street. And we ended up turning that street into a public square. So we blocked it and um, laid sod grass out along the entire street in front of the museum and just served free popcorn and um, cotton candy. And people just hung out all day and the Calliope played its own, Kara had programmed it with music, but then also um, Jason came that evening right at sunset to play. So that's, that's what that is. And then with Ralph Lemon, I really wanted to bring Ralph into the collection. Um, and the initial idea was that I had shown this work, the, at the time was the Fuck Bruce Nauman piece, which was the video in the neon um, at the Walker in an exhibition. And um, I wanted to acquire it for the Whitney, but uh, Ralph said to me when I asked him about it, oh, it's not finished. So we did this trippy thing where we used the acquisition funds. I hope this doesn't get me in trouble. I mean, the Whitney leadership knows we did this, but <laughs> we used the acquisition funds to, so that Ralph could actually finish the piece. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a really unusual way of, of doing things, but in the spirit of performance, um, mm -hmm. it, we're able to do that. Uh, and so it's these two pieces, and then, I don't know if I put a next slide, no, I didn't, okay. So these two pieces, and then there's a piece that is a riff on Nauman's um, John Coltrane piece, right? Mm -hmm. He made a piece in honoring um, John Coltrane when he died it was a kind of, um, it's on the floor, really beautiful, you should look it up. And so Ralph made that, but then he also made another neon that sits underneath the steel piece and it looks like um, the aluminum platform, sorry. And it looks, um, and, and no one can ever see it. So all you see is the light seeping out and no one knows what it actually says. We have photographs of it, but it's not to be shown. And so it has this whole way as a piece where he wants the staff to um, manipulate it and change it um, while it's while it's installed. So uh, it has a life. Of opacity, itself. relationality. I mean, that's that's absolutely fantastic. Yeah. And then Lorraine O'Grady, we were able to bring. Lorraine into the collection. This was the first time she was in the Whitney's collection and we did that um, my first year there. It's one of the things I'm most proud of. Mm -hmm. And Renee Green, we brought her into the collection with her first installation. Um, and what was so meaningful about this is that Renee had been, I mean, Huey, she's in your dissertation, she's in my dissertation. Mm -hmm. She's like this incredible artist. Um, she had, a, the videos that are in early videos in this installation were actually part of the work that she had in the 1993 biennial that the Whitney did not acquire. So when I came, I thought, oh my gosh, we have to have these videos. And so this is a piece that Renee had made in 2010 to kind of both put the videos in the context of her installation, the most recent installation work that's really about color. She's got an amazing show up right now at uh, Bordolami Gallery. I encourage people to mask up and go see it if they can. But yeah, this is this is um, Renee's piece that we just brought into the collection this year. Yeah, this is from Import Export Funk Office. So this is the, these are the videos that make up early videos. And I mentioned Dave McKenzie's piece that's coming. And then there's a show that's coming of My Barbarian. And then this was the piece I did with David Hammonds last um, September, where we did the groundbreaking for his new public art sculpture that will um, be opening soon. And that's it. Um, amazing, thank you. Uh, I really wanna thank you both so much for um, such a fascinating and thoughtful conversation tonight. Um, it was such an honor to have you. Uh, and I also want to thank SAIC for partnering with us on this and, and really, you know, Trevor, Lauren, and Hannah for um, coming together and really making it all happen tonight. 
Uh, the program is really, Art and Dialogue uh, is really designed to foster connectivity between visual artists, curators, and the public. So I feel like tonight really uh, was an amazing example of that connectivity. So thank you again to our panelists and to everyone uh, for joining us tonight.